welcome. Welcome to our study on the Gospel of Luke. This is your Pastor Yadi. In this chapter, I'm going to talk about issues and answers. And we're going to stay in Luke 20. So I hope that the commentary of Gospel of Luke helps you to a better understanding of Scripture. We cannot just literally take all the words that is in this library of all the books in the Bible. It could be very dangerous. We need the Spirit of God that He reveals us. And God is the one who reveals and the Word of God. Our bread of life and a source where we can build our relationship with Christ and with others. God guides us through His Word. So that we can be transformed. Transformed to become more in the image of Christ. Jesus had already told the twelve to accept conflict and suffering when they arrived in the holy city. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. You can find it in Luke 9, 22. Jesus knew fully what was coming, and he was not afraid. In this chapter, you meet the three groups of religious leaders, Luke 20, verse 1, and witness their conflict with Jesus. They challenged him because he had cleansed the temple and called them thieves. They tried to catch him in his words so they could trump up some charge against him and have him arrested as an enemy of the state. But there was more to this series of questions than mere guile. The word translated rejected in Luke 9.22 and also Luke 20, 17, means to reject after investigation. It was required that the Jews carefully examine the Passover lambs from the 10th day to the 14th day to make sure they had no blemishes. And you can find the scriptures in Exodus in the Old Testament 12, verses 1 to 6. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, John 1, 29, was watched and tested by his enemies during that final week, and yet in spite of what they saw and learned, they rejected him. However, Jesus was also examining them, for as they questioned them, uh, questioned him, he questioned them, and their responses revealed the ignorance, hatred, and unbelief of their hearts. Our Lord's questions centered on four different men. The first one, a question about John the Baptist, chapter 20, verses 1 to 19. The cleansing of the temple was a dramatic event that both captured the intention of the people and aroused the anger of the religious establishment. The fact that Jesus daily made the temple his headquarters for ministry only made the members of the Sanhedrin more indignant. So they decided to question him. What authority do you have to do these things? They ask. And if you do have authority, who gave it to you? Authority is important for the success of any social, political or religious organization. Without authority, you have confusion. The chief priests claimed their authority from Moses, for the law 
set the tribe of Levi apart to serve in the sanctuary. The scribes were students of the law and claimed their authority from the rabbis whose interpretations they studied. The elders of Israel were the leaders of the families and clans chosen usually for their experience and wisdom. All of these men were sure of their authority and were not afraid to confront Jesus. They wanted to push our Lord into a dilemma so that no matter how he answered, he would be in trouble. If he said that he had no authority, then he was in trouble with the Jews for invading their temple and acting like a prophet. If he said that his authority came from God, then he would be in trouble with the Romans, who were always alert to would-be messiahs, especially during Passover seasons. If you can find those scripture verses in Acts 5, 34-39 and Acts 21, 37-39. And note our Lord's wise approach as he turned things around and put them completely on the, the defensive. First, he asked a question. Luke 20, 3-8. Then he gave a parable. Luke 20, 9-16. And finally, he quoted a prophecy. Luke 20, 17-18. In each of these approaches, he revealed the sin of the nation of Israel. Their past rejection, you can find them in verses 3 to 8. Jesus took them back to John the Baptist for two reasons. First, John had pointed to Jesus and introduced him to the nation. John 1, 15 to 34. So, their rejection of John was actually a rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, it is a spiritual principle that if we disobey truth, we already know God cannot reveal new truth to us. See John seven fourteen to 17 Why answer their question when they had refused to submit to John's message? Now, it was the religious leaders who were in the dilemma. No matter what answer they gave, they were in trouble. So they decided to play dumb and not answer at all. They were deceitful in asking the question and dishonest in the way they avoid answering it. Even if Jesus had given them an answer, their, heart, their hearts were not prepared to receive it. If they had disobeyed God's message given by John the Baptist, they would disobey the message given by God's Son. That was the theme of the parable Jesus told. Their present rebellion, verses 9 to 16. These men knew the scriptures and recognized that Jesus was speaking about the vineyard of Israel. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. God the Father blessed the nation abundantly and gave the Jews a land that was rich and pleasant. All he asked was that they obeyed his status and gave him the spiritual harvest he deserved. Instead of being grateful for their blessings and joyfully giving the Lord his due, the nation proceeds to rob God and reject his messengers. See for this Nehemiah 9.26 Jeremiah 7, 25 to 26 and chapter 25 in Jeremiah verse 4. God was patient and sent them one servant after another, but they refused to obey. Finally, he sent his beloved son, Luke 3, 22, and they killed him. In this story, Jesus gave his own death announcement. Under Jewish law, any man could lay claim to ownerless property. The tenants may have concluded that the owners were, was dead, otherwise he would have come himself. 
If they kill the son, then they could claim the vineyard for themselves. This is exactly the way the religious leaders were thinking as they stood there before Jesus. Their future ruin, verses 17 to 18. Jesus fixed a steady gaze on them and quoted Psalm 118, 22. The, ru the rulers knew that this was a messianic psalm, and they had heard it shouted by the crowds when Jesus rode into the city. And compare Luke 19, 38 with Psalm 118, verse 26. By applying this verse to himself, Jesus was clearly claiming to be the Messiah. The builders, of course, were the Jewish religious leaders. Acts 4, verse 11. In the Old Testament, the stone is a familiar symbol of God and of the promised Messiah. See Genesis 49, 24, Exodus 17, 6, 33, chapter 22 in Exodus, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, verse 15, 30 to 31, Isaiah 8, 14, chapter 28 in Isaiah, verse 16, and 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. And please read them. Because Jews did not believe, they stumbled over him and were judges. Those who trust Jesus Christ find him to be the foundation stone and the chief cornerstone of the church. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 and Ephesians 2 verse 20. But Jesus also referred to Daniel 2, 34 to 35 and 44 to 45. Where the Messiah is pictured as a smitting stone, that crushes all that gets in its way, he was warning the Sanhedrin that they would only destroy themselves if they condemned him. The same principle applies today and unbelievers should carefully heed his warning. When the rulers rejected John the Baptist, they sinned against the Father who sent him. When they crucified Jesus, they sinned against the Son. Jesus had told them that they could sin against him and still be forgiven. But when they sinned against the Holy Spirit, there could be no forgiveness. Matthew 12, verses 24 to 37. Why? Because it was the end of God's witness, witness to the nation. This is the so-called unpardonable sin. And it was committed by the Jewish leaders when they finally rejected the witness of the Spirit of God through the apostles. The evidence of their rejection was the stoning of Stephen, Acts 7, 51-60. Then the gospel went from the Jews to the Samaritans, Acts 8, and then to the Gentiles, Acts 10. In this parable, Jesus illustrated the insidious nature of sin. The more we sin, the worse it becomes. The tenants started off beating some of the servants and wounding others, but they ended up becoming murderers. The Jewish leaders permitted John the Baptist to be killed. They asked from Jesus to be crucified, and then they themselves stoned Stephen. They sinned against the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that was the end of God's witness to them. It is a serious thing to reject the message of God and the messengers of God. See John 12, 35-43, and Hebrews 2, 1-4. Second, a question about Caesar. As we know, we are in... Luke 20, so the verses 20 to 26. As Jesus knew that the men who questioned him were spies sent by the Pharisees and the Herodians, Mark 12, 13, 
but he patiently listened and replied. These two groups were usually fighting each other, but now they had a common enemy, and this brought them together. They wanted to discuss taxes on, and Roman authority, hoping to provoke Jesus into offending either the Jews. Pay the poll tax. Or the Romans, don't pay the poll tax. But Jesus lifted the discussion to a much higher level and forced the spies to think about the relationships between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of man. Governmental authority is instituted by God and must be respected. Proverbs 8.15, Daniel 2.21 and 37-38, Romans 13. 1 Peter 2, 11-17 Yes, our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3, verse 20 And we are strangers and pilgrims on earth. But that does not mean we should ignore our earthly responsibilities. Human government is essential to a safe and orderly society for man is a sinner and must be kept under control. Jesus was not suggesting that we divide our loyalties between God and government, since the powers that be are ordained of God. Romans 13, verse 1. We live as good citizens when we obey the authorities for the Lord's sake. When obedience to God conflicts with obedience to man, then we must put God first. Acts 4, 19 to 20 and Acts 5 verse 29 and I know I know that I gave you a lot of scriptures verses to write down but the time is yours but we must do it in a manner that is honorable and loving even if we cannot respect the people in office we must respect the office the counsel that Jeremiah gave to the Jewish exiles in Babylon is a good one for God's strangers and pilgrims to follow today. Jeremiah 29, verse 7, Seek the peace of the city. Caesar's image and name were on the coins, so it was basically his currency. To pay the poll tax meant simply to give Caesar back that which belongs to him. God's image is stamped on us, and therefore he has the right to command our lives as citizens in his kingdom. We should seek to be such good citizens that God will glorify and the unsaved will be attracted to the gospel and want to become Christians. 1 Peter 2, 9-12, 3, 8-17. It is unfortunate that some Christians have the mistake idea that the more obnoxious they are as citizens, the more they please God and witness for Christ. We must never violate our conscience, but we should seek to be peacemakers and not troublemakers. Daniel is an example to follow. Study Daniel. It's a very good book. Even it's not an easy book, but it explains a lot. And pray that the Spirit, as you study, will unfold. Three. A question about Moses. Twenty, twenty-seven to forty. Next in line were the Sadducees with a hypothetical question based on the Jewish law of they violate marriage. Genesis 38, Deuteronomy 25, 5-10. The word devirate comes from the Latin levir, which means a husband's brother. 
The Sadducees accepted as scriptures only the five books of Moses, and they did not believe in angels, spirits, or the resurrection of the dead. Acts 23 verse 8 They claimed that Moses did not write about any of these doctrines. The priestly party in Israel was composed of Sadducees, which explains why the priests opposed the apostles' preaching of the resurrection. Acts 4, 1-2 And why they wanted to kill Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. John 12, 10-11 Jesus pointed out that his opponents were wrong and that their questions revealed assumptions that limited God's power and denied God's word. Resurrection is not reconstruction. It is a miraculous granting of a new body that has continued continuity with the old body but not identity. Paul compared our present body to a plant seed and the future resurrected body to be glorious flower and fruit. 1 Corinthians 15, 35-50 our Lord's resurrection body was the same as before his death, and yet different. His friends recognized him and even felt him. He could eat food, and yet he could also walk through closed doors, changed his appearance, and vanished suddenly. And sometimes they didn't recognize him. Interesting. They recognize him. We know the story of the Emmaus. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. It's very powerful. The future life with God is not a mere continuation of present life, only on a higher scale. We will maintain our identities and know each other, but there will be no more that. Hence, no need for marriage and procreation. Christians do not become angels. In heaven we will share the image of Jesus Christ and be much higher than the angels. 1 John 3 and verse 2 Angels appear in scripture as men, but they are spirit beings without sexuality. It is in this regard that we will be like them. There will be no marriage or childbearing in heaven. Is not God powerful enough to raise the dead and give them new bodies suited to their new environments? If today he can give different bodies to the various things in creation, why can he not give people new bodies at the resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 44. Question mark. In their attempt to be rational, the Sadducees denied the very power of God. But Jesus went beyond logic and referred them to the Word of God, particularly what happened to Moses as recorded in Exodus 3. There God identified himself with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and thus affirmed that these three patriarchs were very much alive. But if they were alive, then they were out of the body, for they had died. James 2.26 There must be a real world of spirit beings of Moses would not have written these words. By the way, Moses also affirmed the existence of angels. Genesis 19, verse 1 Chapter 15, 28 Chapter 12 no, I will go back. Genesis 19, verse 1. And verse 15. Then chapter 28, verse 12. And then chapter 32, verse 1. That's a better one. But Jesus said that Exodus 3, verse 6, and 15 to 16 verses thought not only the truth of life after death, but also the reality of the resurrection. In what way? Not by direct statement, but by inference. God is the God of the whole person, spirit, 
soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Because he created the whole person, he does not simply save our souls and ignore the rest of our being. Inherent in the very nature of God's creative act is his concern for the total person. Hence, he will not keep us disembodied spirits forever, but will give us glorious bodies to match our heavenly perfection. Another factor is God's conven conventional relationship with the patriarchs. He made promises of earthly blessings to them and their descendants, but he cannot fulfill these promises if his people are going to live forever only as disembodied spirits. Can there be a glorious new heaven and earth, but not corporeal glory for the people of God? Jesus affirmed what the Sadducees denied, the existence of angels, the reality of life after death, and the hope of a future resurrection. And he did it with only one passage from Moses. Of course, he could have referred to other passages that teach a future resurrection. But he met his adversaries on their own ground. See Job chapter 14, verse 14. Chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Psalm 16, verses 9 to 10. Chapter Psalm 17, I mean, verse 15, and then Isaiah 26, 19, Ezekiel 37, and Daniel 12, verse 2. Oh, what all scriptures, right? And sometimes I get lost with the chapter or the verses, but anyway, if you get lost, listen back. And it's fine. Four, a question about David, 20, 41 to 44. While the Pharisees were still gathered together, Jesus asked them a final question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Matthew 22, 41 to 42. This is the key question for every generation and each individual for our salvation and eternal destiny are dependent on what we think about Christ. 1 John 2, 21 to 25, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and chapter 5, verse 1 in 1 John. Of course, they knew the expected reply, the son of David. They based this on such verses as 2 Samuel 7, 13 to 14. Isaiah 11 verse 1 and Jeremiah 23 verse 5. God had obtained that the Messiah should come from the family of David and be born in David's city, Bethlehem. Micah 5 verse 2. The fact that the Jewish people identified Jesus with Nazareth, not Bethlehem, indicates that they had not really looked into the facts connected with his birth. John 7, 40-53. Jesus then referred them to Psalm 110, which is quoted in the New Testament more than any other psalm. The Jewish religious, religious leaders in that day identified Psalm 110 as a prophetic psalm and said that David was speaking of the Messiah. But if the Messiah is David's Lord, how can he be David's son? He was an enigma for them to solve. The only explanation is that the Messiah must be both God and man. As eternal God, Messiah is David's Lord, but as man, he is David's son. Romans 1, 3, chapter 9, 4 to 5, Acts 2, 32 to 63, and 13, 22 to 20. Three. On Palm Sunday, the multitude had acclaimed Jesus as the Son of God, and he had not rebuked them. 
by applying Psalm 110 verse 1 to himself Jesus claimed to be Israel's promised Messiah, the Son of God. Then why did the Pharisees not believe in him? Because their minds were made up, their hearts were hardened, and their eyes were blinded. They did not have the courage to confess the truth, and they persecuted those who did affirm faith in Jesus Christ. Christ's question silenced his enemies, Matthew twenty-two forty-six, and ended their public challenges, but they would not admit defeat. There is a double tragedy here. First of all, their deliberated hypocrisy was only a cover-up that enabled them to fool people and exploit them. Of all rackets, religious rackets are the worst. The religious leaders had turned the temple of God into a den of thieves and religious devotion into play-acting. The general public actually thought that their leaders were godly men, when in reality they were defiling and destroying souls. The second tragedy is that they rejected their own Messiah and voted to crucify him. They led the nations into ruin because they would not admit their sins and confess Jesus Christ. Keep in mind that these men were experts in the Bible saying the Old Testament, as they call the Torah. Yet they did not apply its truth to their own lives. Their religion was a matter of external observance, not internal transformation. At this point, according to Matthew, Matthew 23, 37-39, Jesus once again uttered a lamentation over the blind unbelief of the nation and their unwillingness to trust in him. He had given them many opportunities, but they had wasted them. Now it was too late. The same tragedy is reenacted today. This is why the Holy Spirit warns today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Hebrew 3 verses 7 and 8. How often I wanted to, but you were not willing. Matthew 23, verse 37. Let me give you some questions for personal reflection or group discussion. What effect did Jesus' cleansing of the temple have on his foes? Why? How was Jesus' authority different from that of the chief priests, scribes, and elders? How did Jesus respond to their questions about his authority? In Jesus' responses, what sins of Israel did he reveal? In what ways is Jesus' authority an encouragement to us rather than a threat? And this, my dear friends, is the end of chapter 20 of the Gospel of Luke. Well, the Word of God is powerful, and it's indeed split. It's like a two-edged sword. May you find 
truth in your search. May you find confidence in what Jesus Christ is teaching you. And may the Holy Spirit unfold you in your struggles or and not seeing very clear what God has to say. We know very well as of today that the Messiah is not recognized by a lot of Jews. But also for Gentiles, as we call them, for those who are not choose Christ in their life. Let us pray that this world receive them as a full Messiah, the Son of God, who came to this world and died and gave us, through his death, a new life. So those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old is passed away. Your identity is in Christ. May God bless you. And may the peace of God be with you. Bye.